So don't worry about setting up your Emacs files and whatnot right now. We'll go through how to do an update and grab the latest version. We'll set up some bookmarks and things to try and make it a little bit easier. So let's start off and back up a little bit. This figure is in the, uh, the category of I was hoping to show it sometime during the semester. But I want to give you a sense of how I view GIS, because this is different for many different people. What you're trying to accomplish is not always the same. And how people view what it is to be a, a GIS person and whether or not that's a technician spot or a high level research spot, I kind of feel like it can be in all of the above. So I want to show you, this is sort of how I think of GIS. It took me giving lectures and research tools in past years to try and decide that I didn't like the definitions that I saw from people because they really don't, don't feel like they include what we do as uh, marine mappers in a lot of ways that a lot of GIS is focused towards the city planner and their world and our world don't always line up very well. Although I think our world encompasses what they do, their world is kind of a subset of what goes on. So I'll just sort of walk you through this really rough, and it's not perfect, it's just sort of a conceptual thing of what's going on. But I see what we do with GIS and marine mapping is you're sensing the world, so you're collecting uh, location, time, other sorts of data, your error and certainty and metadata about the world as you go around in the ship or wherever you are capturing stuff. And this, when it gets into a computer, I tend to refer to this as your level zero data. It's your raw, unprocessed world. Then we sort of have an us and them kind of mentality going on here where we're working with data and then it's going off to other people and maybe you get some stuff back from them. It goes possibly through some conversion and into your data store. And from there, you tend to do data transformations, you apply algorithms to it, and you do reprojections, you know, all sorts of different things that you can do to your data to manipulate it. You do visualization, so either 2D map style or 3D or however you want to visualize. You can turn it into audio. I consider that visualization if you want to listen to your multi-beam data or something. You're going to apply queries to that data. You're going to ask the data questions. And you might even do physical output. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll make a physical model of the seafloor. We'll ask a physical printer to make a plastic model of like a, a harbor. And all of that's leading into informed decision making. So basically you're trying to, to make decisions with data. If you weren't going to use it for something to affect the world, why did you spend the time collecting it? So this could be you know, climate change decisions. It could be navigating a ship on a chart. You know, that going through here, this, you could be producing a chart that comes out, be going to somebody. It could be coastal and marine spatial planning if you're a government person. You know, it could be any number of things. If this was a person doing GIS for a city, this could be, you know, like the, the ordinances for your house and the rules that, that apply to where you live. And then you're making decisions based on that for your life, but you're also feeding that back. There should be an arrow that wraps around back to why are you collecting more data? So you make some decisions. We don't know enough about the US waters to be totally comfortable with what we know what's out there. So we, if we were all good, we would stop sending out NOAA ships doing surveying. We'd be, okay, last year was the last year of NOAA surveying, we're done. Uh, let's all just you know, take a vacation. That's not what happens. You basically go take the output of this, feed it back to the beginning and say, where do we need to survey next year? You know, we gotta keep going back and collecting more data. Well, this the form decision making is so where are we going to send our ships next year because we have limited resources. We'd always love to have way more survey ships than we have. So it's this kind of loop of going through this process that is what we're trying to talk about in this class. And it can be done with a lot of different tools. Some of them are low level. We could be writing scripts or we could be using high level things like Keras and ArcGIS. And being able to mix and match all those things, you end up with this model of the world. So this is sort of how I view GIS at a high level. You can sort of see some of my biases in there. and. I encourage you to find, to ask other people and find out what other people are saying about what they think this process is because not everybody considers it the same thing. I've made sure that I've got error and uncertainty and metadata in there and a lot of people don't really want to deal with that kind of stuff. Or they may make more emphasis of it and that there might be huge things and everything else around that might be small. So definitely ask people as you go through your courses and as you leave here how they view data and how that data is going to influence the, the whole process of our lives. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to dig into 
using IPython to first update using Mercurial, our class, since it's not available for download as an HTML yet. We're going to play with IPython bookmarks, but then we're going to go in and work on our SBET project a little bit more. And uh, thanks to Bree, we have two more SBET files so that we can try and work on command line arguments where we process multiple files at the same time. We'll look at a couple different ways to do that. If we get time, we're going to write a KML and we're going to try and write an SQL database. We're not going to get too far in SQL, but you'll at least have seen writing an SQL database and we'll try and show loading that up in a graphical tool so you can actually take a look at your data that you've written it as more of a spreadsheet style from the database. So let's yeah. jump into the notes here. We're going to start by updating before we go and load up our Emacs. So start up by Python. I'm going to show you guys some neat features in IPython. I'm still getting to know some of them, and I've been asking a lot of questions to the IPython team. If they're listening to this at Berkeley, I appreciate their help. So we'll go ahead and say bookmark-l. Now, bookmark is a part of IPython. It's not a normal Python command. I have two bookmarks. Yours should not have anything in there yet. Yours will be blank right now. So let's cd into tilde slash projects research tools, press enter. If we do an ls, you'll see that we've got our checked out copy of the class that we did uh, like two lectures ago or so. If we want to save this location and make it easier to get back to, for example, you don't always remember everywhere on your disk. If you get more and more going on, it gets hard to remember everything. We can say bookmark hg class. So for me, that means mercurial class location. You could call this bookmark whatever you wanted that made sense to you. I'm not, not a good person in figuring out clever bookmarks, but maybe you can come up with something better. If you press enter, and now if you do a bookmark dash L, you guys should have, you won't have the C24 yet, but you'll have the HG class link, and it will point at that particular spot on your disk. That'll get us going on one bookmark. We'll use the bookmarks as we go, and you'll see, see how they work in a bit. We've saved a bookmark. Now I'm going to do an update on the Mercurial files that we have here. But before we do that, I'm going to save a, a look at what's in that directory. So if we do an ls tilde slash before dot text, so we're using that greater than to send it to a file. So we're saving what our directory looks like before we've done the update. And hopefully you guys have not updated yet today. Oh, you guys are too efficient. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll do an ls-l, and pardon me for a second here. We'll just go and be, we'll make a random change. <laughs> what we'll say is, how about, please do not update until the Professor. <laughs> oh dear. No, that's fine. I that's that's cool. So we'll change things up a little bit. This will be good. You know, it's Thanksgiving week, so we'll say HG uh, status. You can watch me do some Mercurial stuff as I check things out. So I've got a modified file in here, so I can do an HG diff, and I'll see the changes. I've added a couple lines. So I'll say HG commit the students in research tools are too quick. And then hg push, this is going to send it up to the server, make you guys have to update. There is a new change on the server. Don't update yet. So we'll change it up. And for our before, we'll do a dash l. So we'll do a long listing. And you'll see that the files will actually change. So you, if, if you've done it already, you'll have a 24 lecture in your directory. So do an ls dash l greater than tilde slash before dot text. So if we do a less tilde slash before dot text, you see it, oh, I'm in the wrong location. CD into class, that would be better. This is gonna be a wonderful lecture today as I uh, figure out what's going on. Rerun that command from inside of the class directory. And if we do that less before, we should see all the files in the class. So we'll see that there is a 24 in there for me. If you don't have it, that's great. So make sure you're in Home Research Tools Projects Research Tools class and that you've done that before. 
And so now we can do our bang to run a bash shell command. HG pull. So we're going to go grab stuff off of the Bitbucket site. You can see it's talking to Bitbucket. And here's our updates. So we've had three change sets with three changes to one file. We can say HG update, but with an exclamation point in front. And we'll then pull those changes into our directory. And that's bad for me. Uh, you guys shouldn't have that. So are we just being classed through the pull? You don't have to be there, no. Let me, don't do what I'm doing. I'm trying to get myself resorted here. <laughs> You've now caused me, I've caused myself to enter into the world of things I haven't tried before. So, <laughs> to buy research tools. This is the best part about revision control. I just deleted my entire tree and I'm going to start over. And that's totally okay. So I can go up here and there's this nice command, hg clone, and I'm going to start right from the beginning. So now I can paste that in. So this is the nice thing about revision control. Your world gets completely messed up, and you can always go back to some other state without too much trouble. So if I say ipython cd research tools class, there we go. OK, so now I am now where you guys should be. And you've done the before. So now if you do a hg, so you've done the hg pull, hg update. Nothing's changed for me because I just did a, a checkout. But now what you can do is say ls-l greater than to send that to a file tilde slash after dot txt. So you can see on my desktop here I have these two files before and after. We're going to run a diff command to check out what was the difference between those two files. Diff is a great programmer's tool for seeing what goes on. So we can say diff and here's where I'm going to and X revert buffer. I'm going to go find those in my notes. So there was our GS lecture. We're in setup. And we're right here at this diff command. Say diff dash dash. Oop, it's got to have a, a bang in the front for a shell command. Unified. There's lots of different ways to present diffs. Unified is kind of a friendlier way. Tilde slash before dot txt and tilde slash after dot txt. Yours hopefully will look fairly simple. Mine is going to look a little crazy, I bet. Mine is terrible. So my hope was that you would see just a small one. So if you're lucky, you'll have just a couple lines with a plus and a minus. And with a directory listing, it's kind of annoying because directory listings like to start with a dash. Any line that starts with a plus, and this is hopefully you have a nicer example with just a small change on one file, they'll see a plus by new lines and a minus by old mm -hmm. lines. And mine has not really done a very good job of, of being a good example. I'm going to redo that in a video with it working. So you guys can see the fact that you can do diffs and check out what's changed between different versions. I see a couple of you have got some nice ones up. What are multiple pluses and minuses? Multiple pluses and minuses? So if you see two minuses, the problem with an ls-l is it starts off typically with like minus rw for this is a uh, this would be a D if this was a directory. So if you're seeing a minus out here or a plus out here in the first column, this is whether or not a line is being added or removed. And then these minuses are just a part of the text that's after it. So it's confusing. It takes a long time to get used to looking at diffs. They're really, really helpful, but they're kind of strange. And then up above, you'll see plus, 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 and minus, minus, minus. This is showing you the source file and the after file, like the beginning and the end file that's comparing. <coughs> and so it's showing you information about the time and which one is the, so you started with the minus, minus, minus file and you're going to the plus, plus, plus file. That's a really bad example of using diffs up on the screen, but I see a couple of you have got really nice ones on your screen. So I'll redo it and I'll put a nice figure in the, the class notes that shows it working. It's one of those time dependent things you gotta be careful with what you do. We've now updated our notes, so we can now go create our class directory. So we'll do make dir tilde slash class 24, cd tilde slash class 24. And what we can do now is we can add a, a second bookmark. Since we're going to be working with this today, we can say bookmark c24, just short for class 24. So now type bookmark dash l, and you'll see that you have a bookmark for C24 that points you at that class location 
an HG class, which is where, not quite the right spot there, but it basically it's a link to somewhere where our mercurial stuff is. So you can create bookmarks for, if you've got a bunch of different data sets you're working with and some source code, it might not be a bad idea to create some bookmarks where those are if you're jumping back and forth and working within a project a lot. It's a pretty handy tool to be able to see what's going on. So we can say PWD, right now we're in the class 24, then say CD HG class, and it takes you to where that link is. So if we do a PWD, we're now somewhere else, bookmark-l, so we've got our C24, so we can CD into C24, and we're now back in the class directory. Is a problem if uh, I am uh, a subdirectory with the same name? There's times when it's going to get confused. If you're in a subdirectory with an alias of the same name, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I haven't tried that yet to see how it, whether it gets completely confused or if it uses the bookmark. Is that HG? It should be research tools. So this, this is probably not the best place to point. I would maybe point it to, like if I do CD HG class, probably better to make CD into class and then say bookmark HG class bookmark dash L. That's what I think I have in the notes. So it makes a little more sense. So I'm going to say CD C24 and get back over to the class 24 we're going to work today. These are just tools that you're going to decide whether or not you even want to use. And if you like them, then give them a go. Let's go ahead and start up that log file. Make sure you're in class 24 and type log start dash O dash R log dash class 24.py. If we do an ls, you'll now see that we've got our log file going in there. It will actually go back and record the stuff we have from before. So if we do less log class, we'll actually see it goes back and captures all of my messing around. So if you, the nice thing about this is if you get partway through, you forgot your log file, go ahead and start it and it will go back and grab your history. Now there's some other fun commands that we can do. You have a directory history, so dhist. So it's going to list all the directories that you've been to, and you can say cd minus 2, minus 1, and you also have, I think it's underscore dh, is your directory history, so you can say dh1. And so if you, if you get interested in using these directory histories, I would suggest just playing around with them until you get comfortable. I'm not there yet in terms of being really comfortable with them. But more importantly, let's create an alias that you might use fairly often to do that update task that we just did. So if you get back to the next class, when you want to get ahead of me, you can do it even faster. So if you type alias, this lists the aliases that are currently available. And unfortunately, I didn't delete my aliases, so I've, I'm, you'll see the one that I'm about to create with you guys. But you can say alias RT update for research tools update. And what we did in this update is we CD'd into the directory where the Mercurial stuff lived we ran hg pull, and then we ran hg update. And we can do all of that in one line, and we don't have to remember that line every time. So what we can say is cd tilde slash projects research tools, semicolon hg pull, semicolon hg update, right parenthesis, and I'll explain what this all does. So we have our alias magic command for IPython, then we've got RT update, which is the name of our alias that we're creating. And then everything from here on out is that command you're going to stick in the alias. In bash, these nice parentheses here will protect you from the CD. So inside that scope, they're going to change directory. When you come back out, you get dropped back where you were. At least I hope that's how it works. So we jump into that directory. Semicolon starts a new shell command. Then hg pull, hg update. Let's see if this actually works. Yeah, I'm realizing I'm not sure this works, so we'll just try it. <laughs> yep, it does. And it's left me in class 10 where I really don't want to be because I left myself there. So CDC24, I'm back where I was. So if we type alias, it'll give us all. If you want to save that for future sessions, there's a way to store that, and the command is store RT update, and that will save it in your aliases that are permanent between sessions. So if you have commands that you want to run fairly <laughs> often that kind of get yourself going or handle certain tasks, you can create a bunch of aliases for those things, save them in there, and when you come back to IPython next time, they'll still be there. 
I have a little note down here. Some of these commands are broken in IPython 0.11, which is the next version after the one we're using. But I think they said they're going to come back in the version that's about to come out soon. So never fear, they will get fixed. Now today, we're going to grab three different SBET files. We've been working with just one up till now. So if you copy these three curl commands, edit, copy, and just blindly paste them in over here in your IPython shell, it's going to go off and fetch two more SBETs. So do an ls-l once you've got it. So you should have three bzipped SBETs. And then I've got three nice little B unzipped commands, so you don't have to type them if you don't want to. Copy, edit, paste. If we do another ls-l, you'll see that we've got three SBET files for us to work with today. And if you are good and motivated and want to try some MD5 sums to make sure that you've got the same stuff that I've got, those are the MD5 sums. Now, if you want to try it after class, you can also create a bash alias. So I've got instructions on how to do that from bash, if you'd like mm -hmm. to do that. And there's a file called tilde slash bash aliases that you can add into that. So bash aliases is this file in your home directory, and you can put in an alias. The format is slightly different between IPython and bash, but it's pretty close. You just have, you have to have an equal sign in here and put it in quotes. So you can create an alias that works whether in Bash or in IPython. I'll let you guys explore that if you get motivated, but we won't spend any more time on it. And let's go ahead and copy the source code. I've got a where were we last time section, and we're going to copy all of that Python code from last time and paste it into an sbet.py file in your class 24 directory. So <coughs> control space on the beginning of the source code. Scroll down. It's getting even longer. This is becoming a very inefficient way to get going. All the way down to the bottom where you've got your end source, meta w copies. I'm going to do a control x, control f, and watch out where you are. I've left the org file in a different place than I haven't copied it to my class directory this time. So we need to go back to tilde slash, and if you just type tilde slash anywhere in the find file line, it'll start over from the top. So class 24 sbet.py. So we're going to open up a new file. It should be blank. Let's so go ahead and hit enter. And you should be editing the sbet file. Press control Y to paste all that in. So it should be a new file. And it should be in your class 24 directory. And save it. And I'm going to quick skim back through where we were last time to remind you all of what we were working on. Since some of the stuff was the first time you'd seen it. We had just written our load sbet file function. That's a this generator thing, this kind of strange creature that will keep returning to us datagrams. So we've written that code with a special yield statement down here that returns a datagram each time through this loop. And when it finishes, the, fun, the function goes off the bottom. The generator finishes up and returns back to the for loop that is done. And right here, we hadn't quite done this, but I threw it in for you so you'd see it. For datagram index. So this is the old style of for datagram index in range. So we just walked over the number of datagrams that are in a file. And we were asking for the datagram to decode each one. Let's switch that to, to use our generator. And then we'll go and add some more functionality to this code so that we can do things like write KML, use command line arguments, and uh, generally get a lot fancier. So if we're going to use that generator, if you go into your for loop and delete all of that code, so starting from the datagram index all the way through your decoding of the datagram, let's see if we can replace that with our generator that's going to return a datagram. So control W to delete that. So we'll say for datagram underscore index comma datagram in. And if we start off with our generator, we say load sbet file and sample dot sbet colon. This will loop through there, but we don't now have the number of the datagram as an index. But we'd like to be able to keep track of, as we loop through this file, which datagram we're on. We start with 0, then we go to 1, 2, 3, through the total length of the file. So Python has a special function called enumerate that keeps track of 
how many items have come through. And so it, it takes your datagram and it's going to add to it a count that goes with it. And then we're going to pull apart the datagram index and the datagram. So hopefully this will make things a little bit simpler down the road as we build up code and we can loop through our datagrams with much less code. So I'm going to save that and we're going to give it a shot and see if I've made any typos. So we'll say run sbet.py. You should see a printout of all the datagrams coming through with their indexes. Okay, so we've done things a little bit differently today. If you're seeing run sbet.py saying error file not found, the first thing you should do is do a PWD, print working directory. And if you're in class 10 still, then you need to CD space class 20, C24. So do bookmark dash L to list your bookmarks. And you have a C24, so do a CD space C24. And if you're in class 24 and it's not working, do an LS. <laughs> yep, so you've got it. So now you're seeing how you're getting an error in your code. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened is if you do an LS, you're going to see that you don't have your sample.sbet. So you had, you need to go back and run the curl commands to download the data and the bnzips from the notes. So that's one thing to be careful with when you're, we're working across a lot of different directories. So you have to be aware of where you're at and what directory you're, you're running commands from because it, it has a lot of implications as to where you are. Can you explain again enumerate? Yeah. Definitely. What happens with um, enumerate here, if we didn't have enumerate and we just had load SBIT file, it's going to return to us each time through a datagram. If you wrap something in enumerate, every time it comes back, this will count how many things have come through and it will add on another variable that's a number to go with it. We could, yes. But, but here in this case, you're giving the person the choice. So the, the, pro, the person who's calling load SBIT file doesn't necessarily want to track the number of the datagram. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. And if you do this where you build it into your generator, then they have no choice but to deal with that. And so maybe you don't need it. Maybe you don't care what, what datagram you're on, you're just going to handle them all and not care about the number. Then it's not a big deal and you just remove that. So it's sometimes it's just a style thing about the choice of do we or don't we want to have to have that index always with it. When, when you have enumerate, it's always going to add on the front a number to go with the item of whatever gets returned from that. The next thing we're going to do is we have multiple SBETs. So we'd like to be able to process them through and be able to handle all of the SBETs in the directory. And there's a couple of ways to do that. We're going to start off with simple and not so so clever way of doing it and then we'll step up to the fancier way and then the way that I would traditionally do it was with a command line argument parser that lets you really specify things clearly. The first one has a very odd name called glob, G-L-O-B. So let's import the glob module. So what glob's job is to do is to take things like the stars that we used with ls and expand them. So the glob command will do things like deal with ranges of numbers, the question mark for any character. So we'll say glob dot glob. So there's a glob module which contains the glob function. You can say star dot pi. And this will give us all the Python files in the current directory as a list. So in our case, we've got our log we've got, and then we've got our sbet dot pi that we're working on. Or if we want to know what are all the dot sbet files in there? You can hit glob.glob .glob and pass it star.sbet and we'll see the three different sbets that we had. Now this is this handles a lot of different stuff with you can mix it up. So if we do an ls we can say glob dot glob 2010 star. So this gives everything starting with 2010 and we'll just have one file come back. So it's a list of just length one. <coughs> So you can mix this up and, and call out files that you want. The trouble is, is that if you write a program with this and you hand it to someone else, you've now hard coded that it, it's either going to do say all S, if we had the SBET one like this, you're saying, I'm going to process every SBET in this directory. You don't get a choice. So wherever you run it from, it's going to go find every SBET in that directory and that's what it's going to run. It's not going to do anything more or anything less. Not very flexible but it does get the job done quickly. So sometimes if you're just writing a short bit of code, 
this is the perfect thing to do. And if you actually look at the very bottom of this org file after class, you're going to see some code that I wrote that's, that's horrible. I don't like it. It's not written very well. But it got the job done for today. I took some SBETs that were huge. They were hundreds of megabytes and turned them into these sample files. And I'm never going to reuse that code. So I just did it quick and really horribly dirty. So let's add that glob into our code and create an sbet.py that knows how to loop over a bunch of different files. So we have to make a couple changes. And where we're going to do this is right, right in here. We don't need any more this sbet file and sbet data where we load those. So let's get rid of those two lines. We also are not going to try and print out the number of datagrams right now. We're going to give up on that. And we're going to select this region right here, the print number datagram time XYZ header thing, and then the for datagram index datagram enumerate that loops through all the datagrams and prints them out. If you remember from a while back, there's a command in Emacs that will indent your code. It's under Python, and it's shift region right. So control C greater than. I'll go ahead and do a keyboard. Control C greater than. It adds four spaces on to everything. We're now going to add some extra code before that. So import glob. Typically, you don't want to import modules willy-nilly throughout the code. But for now, we're just going to put it right next to where we're using it. And we're going to say for file name in glob dot glob star dot sbet colon. So this is going to loop through every sbet in our directory. And now down here, we have the load sbet file we had hard-coded in a file name. So make sure you delete everything, including the single quotes. So control W and replace that with file name. So our glob is going to give us back a list. And we're going to walk across each of the file names and work through that file. We'll, we'll add a little bit more in a second. And then we'll add a little bit of extra fun after that in a second. So your code should look in main, should look like this. Get rid of some blank lines here to make it a little bit tighter. So we've just rewritten it, this section here. So we've imported glob. We now have a for file name in glob.glob, .glob, which is not very fun to say. Start a sbet. Inside of our for loop, we're going to print out this little header for each one. And for datagram index, we're going to enumerate over the datagrams in that particular file. So we've changed file name right there. And then this print is just like before. Now this code is going to look a little weird. It's going to mash everything together. So I think it'd be a good idea to have to print out the file name in each loop too. So we'll say print. Just some. It doesn't really matter how you print out the file name, but just so it's obvious, I like to put some stars or equal sign that just sticks out around the file name. So hopefully that'll make a nice little uh, thing where you can see each file starting. So while you're working on that, I'm going to go ahead and try that. So we'll say run sbet dot pi. And a lot of stuff went by. So let's back up and see what happened. And we're going to see some quirks in the sbet that aren't necessarily fun. There's a lot of zeros and lots of stuff. And I'm going to try and find the beginning of that command, which ran off the top. That wasn't fun. So we'll see at the bottom. So I just did run sbet dot pi. Why do we not have to reload it again? So we're using run. Run automatically handles that for you. If we were calling the function inside by itself, then we would need to reload. So do you guys remember that percent operator with numbers last time? It wasn't divide, but it was the remainder, or, or MOD, mod. The really cool thing about remainders is that they have this odd property that they make a really good test if you want to do every nth thing through the loop. So if we have a lot of datagrams, and we don't want to print them all to the screen because it was so much that the scroll back ran out of space and we lost stuff off the top. You can do something with the percent where you say every time we divide by some number and the remainder is zero, we'll go ahead and print. So if that number is like every 10, we can say mod 10. Every time we divide by 10, the remainder is zero, we want to handle it. That means we'll do every 10th item through the loop. And this is something where even programmers who've been programming for a long time haven't seen this kind of trick. And once you see it, you might use it a lot. I certainly use it a lot when I work with big data sets. Because if it say it takes an hour to process your data, and you know how many items are in your data, 
But if it just sits there running, doing nothing, you're going to get very frustrated wait, wondering how far along am I. Or you're going to print out everything and it's going to be overwhelming. So what we can do is use our datagram index. We can say if datagram index mod. So we're going to divide by, and we'll say maybe we'll do every 20. When that equals 0, we're going to do our print. So I hit tab when I was on the line with the print to indent it four spaces. So this is as every 20th, every, any time, every time we go through 20 items, we're going to get back to our remainder being 0. We can use that to test when that's 0. We're going to go ahead and print out that line. So we should see a lot less stuff coming past our screen. So save that. Give it another run. And if you look here at the index number on the left, so we have 480, 500, 520. Before that was going and printing every single line. Now we're printing every 20th line. Sometimes operators like mod, I don't typically need to use it for anything. It's very infrequent that I need to know the remainder or something. I'm usually doing floating point division. But it has this great property that we can use here for a very simple monitoring of stepping through stuff. So if we scroll back up to the top, you can see that we, it doesn't take very many lines to cover when you're doing every 20th. So here we can see one of our files, the header, and then we step into the data. So you're not seeing every single line that would have come out, and it tends to be very handy to do this. Now we've finished with glob. Let's try a way that gives us more flexibility where the user can specify which files to work on. In Python, there is a sys module, so import sys. And in the system module, if you say sys.argv, I'm sorry about the name, but it comes from the 1970s with C and and it, what it means is it's the arguments to the command line. So if we hit enter, and you see it, or you can type print sys.argv, will look about the same. It gives you back a list of all the command line arguments for that particular call. So in this case, if you run it for MyPython, it was how IPython was called. And we didn't give it any arguments, so it's just showing us that it ran user bin IPython. So the first one is always the uh, sysargv sub zero is going to always be the program that was called. And anything that comes after that is then going to be the command line arguments. In this case, if we say print sys.argv square brackets one colon, this isn't going to print anything for us because there's nothing there. If we had called a program with a bunch of options, say we were still using dash pylab with IPython, that would show up here. And with that, we can actually let the user specify which files we want to do. So we're in the notes. Here's how we'll, we'll use that line rather than the glob to create uh, an sbet.py program that we can actually specify which sbets we want to use it on. So I'm going to split this, Control x 2 Control xb to jump back to sbet. In your main function, we have this for file name in glob.glob. .glob. We're going to get rid of glob.glob .glob and replace that with sys.argv one colon in the square brackets. And we need to import sys. Now, if you import something multiple times, maybe we already did sys at the top. I can't remember. It won't hurt anything to import it again. Not a big deal. And now we can specify what files we'd like to have in our command line. Now, to make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. Right below the starting main, why don't we say print sys.argv colon comma sys.argv. So you can see what arguments are being passed in. This is the typical debugging with print rather than using a traditional debugger, which takes a while to learn. So let's try running that. So run sbet.py. And right now, we'll just pass in the sample.sbet. So we'll just do one. Press Enter. You'll see that I made a typo by changing things up. I need to move my imports to before the print. Since I use sys right here, and I had sys imported after I tried to use it. So if we run that, we only did the sbet.py. So you can see sys.argv consisted of our sbet.py program in position 0. And then sample.sbet came in position 1. Why don't you guys, if you've got that working, rerun that command and add 
another SBET file on there. So if you do an ls, you'll see you have a couple SBETs in your directory. We have one that starts with 2010. So we, we ran that before, run sbet.py sample.sbet. If we do 2010, press tab. So we now have two SBET files. Press enter, and it will run both of them. And if we see here, our sys.argv now has three things in it, the first one being our program name, and then two files passed into it. So this way, you can let the person who's using your SBET .py code pick which files they want to run. Maybe you have 10,000 SBETs in a directory, definitely worked on projects with tens of thousands of files, and you probably don't want to run and process all of them at one time. You may be just working on some particular aspect of it. It doesn't necessarily pay to try and process them all at once. So that was the argv way of directly handling it, and you can write really fancy parsers yourself for command lines. Please don't do that. Too many people feel that they can make their own better than everyone else. And then you end up with 80 million ways to parse the command line and you make people like me go completely insane. So we're going to use the Python way of creating command line arguments that's the official blessed way of creating fancy command lines. So you can say dash dash help, have it print out help. And as you add arguments, you create, you're doing it in a way that other people will understand because everybody's using the same approach. Just so I'll point it out before we go on, we have a whole lot of zeros in there. When the, in the SBET format, when it has no data, it likes to write 000 for the position. And it's that giant garbage dump of position data that's right off of Africa there, where lost data goes to die. 000 is a really bad choice for a no data value. If you try and plot up data sets, you'll often see all kinds of things plotting right there off of Africa. So if your data is missing, it might be there. So let's try the argument parser that comes with Python. It's called argparse. There's an older one called optparse. That's the one that's in all of my code. Don't use it. It's old. And so we'll start off by saying import argparse. We'll try it out from inside of IPython first. And here I recommend just copying and pasting for now to go quick. So here I've said parser equals argparse argument parser. It's kind of wordy. And you get to pass it a description. So we now have a parser. And we can say args equals parser, parse args. And it would do the parsing. In this case, nothing's going to happen because we had, we had no arguments to pass in. It wasn't very exciting. What it will do is give us some options to go ahead and create lots of arguments. And I'm just going to go ahead and give you the example. And in order to get to know this better, you'll want to read the documentation. And I'll try and create some videos with some more examples. But what we'll do here is this line is going to say anything that doesn't have an, a dash dash or dash thing to it is going to become a part of our file names list. It's going to be of type string. And every time you see a new one, add it to the list. That's what this nargs things means. And what we'll do then is we'll call args equals parse.parseargs. It's going to go look, since you didn't give any options, it'll look at that sys.argv and figure out what the heck's in there and handle it for us. So let's go ahead and copy this into our code. So we'll do uh, meta w, control x2, control xb. And so we, before we had sys and all this other junk, we'll comment that out. So I'm copying that group of lines from the notes. So import argparse. And we're going to build a parser that looks at our command line. And then we're going to say for file name in args.filenames. So we've told it here this is going to be of name file names. And it's going to magically create this little list in there of anything that we're going to collect to it. So go ahead and save that. And now if we say run sbet.py dash dash help, this will have better work. Press enter. And this looks more like the traditional Linux or GNU style command line arguments. It gives you a built-in help that as you add arguments, they'll appear down at the bottom here. Your description's in there. The nice thing about this tool is it's 
written to handle all those weird cases where people do things that you would never expect. They'll do like the list of file names first, and then they'll have all the dash dash arguments afterwards, stuff like that that's really hard to write a parser for. People have taken the time to do it right here so that you don't have to worry about handling things. So now if we say run sbet.py with nothing, our file names list is going to be empty. It got upset at us for some reason. I'm not quite sure what that help just did. That's within our function now. Yeah, so there's a lot of magic happening behind the scenes. So what it's going to do is we build up all these arguments. And so you can add things like we're going to add a dash dash SQLite to write out a database. If we add that argument, when you say dash dash help, it's going to look at all those and write out a human readable, or at least more readable, form of the arguments in a way that you might get if you ran it from the command line. So it's trying to basically build up uh, an infrastructure. And I've seen people write this code, and it takes them about 100 lines to get to where we are like this. So it's nice to have a library where, well, I know that this is hard to follow in here. If you read through the documentation, look at a few more examples, you'll start getting the pattern. And then you can start adding more arguments and options to your code, and you can build up something where it's pretty powerful. There's our error way back up here. So being that we're in IPython, it also decided to give us a nice trace back that was really confusing. But now that we've said that we have to have one or more file names, when I gave it no file names, it said too few arguments, and then unfortunately threw a pile of tracebacks at us. So let's now rerun it with our sample.sbet. Now it handles that, that case. So if we um, add a print statement in right here, so print file names colon args dot file names, and we'll rerun that. So right after the args equals parser dot parse args, we'll add a print of the file names just so you see them. And if we rerun that, and you'll see up here file name is. So now let's add a second file. So we'll now maybe we'll add the 2011 file. Press enter to run both of them. Now you'll see file names is a list of R2 SBET files. So this is how I would add controlling a way to control parsing a whole bunch of different files together and deciding which ones I want to pick from a directory. And if you want to run all of them, unfortunately in here the star won't work. But if we do a control Z, and we're going back to the bash shell, I haven't shown you job control, unfortunately. I wish I'd shown you guys this before, but you can suspend programs. And so I just did a control Z to suspend. That's suspend your program in the terminal. And when we're done, we can do FG for foreground, get that thing running again. So we'll get back to IPython in a second. We could spend forever going through all these really cool things that are useful, but we kind of have a limited amount of time. So cd tilde slash class slash 24. If you do an ls dash l, you can see we have a sample dot sbet in sbet dot pi. Now it's not executable. We don't have that x flag over there. So we can say chmod plus x sbet dot pi. Now if we do an ls-l star.py, we'll see that we have an executable sbet, and it's now colored green. And then we can run that, so sbet.py dash dash help. We get that same help that we had before, so here's our little help section. And we can say dot slash sbet.py sample dot sbet. It's all great. Now if we want to handle them all, if we're not in IPython, so that's the key factor that got us here, we can say dot slash sbet dot pi star dot sbet. This is going to process every single sbet in that directory. That star doesn't work inside of IPython, unfortunately. So that then zips through all of those files. And so here the file names was all three of them. We'll do the fg command to get back into IPython. Press enter. It shows you which program you're in, it, where you left. So ignore that. Press enter just to, to get back to your IPython prompt. And make sure that you're in class 24. All right, so I've got some examples of running that. Now let's go ahead and take this code. And let's go look at these files, because it really sucks not to see where they are on the globe. So I'd like to see these three SBET files on the globe. 
So we're going to use, we're going to be fairly similar to how we did it before, but we're going to change it up a little bit. So if we look at our sbet.py, so in here, right now we're just looping through and printing out each time. What we'd like to do is write out a KML file. So let's go up and add the functionality to be able to write out a KML file in here. So each time through the loop, right after our print file name, we'll say out equals open. Now, if I say file name, we're going to step, that would step right on top of that file that we're trying to read and kill it, which we don't want to do. So we want to add an extension to it. So we'll say file name plus dot KML in the string. So this is going to open up a file. Now, if we did this and tried to write to it, what would be wrong? Why would it not work? Uh, we'll have a good file name, but why will this not let us write to the, this output file that we want to write to? If we've opened this, can we read from it? And if we open it this way, we can do a read from this one, but we actually, if we want to write to this, we actually have to tell it that we want to write to it. So we need a, a w string at the end there to open for writing. Do you know we just do r w's for For read and write? In this case, it doesn't really help you at all because we're not going to go back and read and write. We want to just write it only. If you were going to be appending to something and going back and reading from it, but generally that's, if you get into that kind of case, I, I tend to try not to program where I'm editing a file and fiddling with it. I try to create a new file that's completely out at the other end. Uh, so I, I don't think I've done read and write in the last 10 years myself. So I would tend to uh, shy away from that. So now we've opened it, let's go ahead and write out the KML header section. Before we had some template files, but we can just do that from inside of here. So I recommend just copying this right now because KML headers aren't very fun. So copy. If we paste that right in here. So we've got four file name and args, print file name. We've then done this output. And here it looks like I've got an indent problem. So I'm going to press tab. So we indent the right number of spaces. And then we're writing out this header section. And this is back to XML where we haven't really gone into detail. In the KML format, this says we're creating an XML file. It's going to be a KML. And then inside of that, we're creating a document, a place mark. We're going to use the format function. So there's the format dot format down here. And we want to put in a file name as our title. And then we're going to do a line string coordinates and write out another line that shows where the ship went based on this SBET file. Now we also need to close up the end of that after we've that will create the header. Inside this loop, we need to, for each datagram, we need to pick out the X and the Y and write them into our KML. So what we can do in there, if we hit tab here, notice that we are now inside of that if statement. We don't want to be inside of that because that means we'll only write every 10th point. And our files aren't that big. If you're doing this with a real SBET that hasn't been down, downsampled, you'll want to do probably every, I think I did every 10,000 points because SBETs are really, really big. So we'll say out dot write, and we're going to want to pass it x in curly braces, comma y in curly braces, and then slash n is a new line, and that string, and we'll say dot format. And so now we can say we need to pass in the x and the y. We'll be doing it this way, where we're going to pick out the x and y out of the datagram. So we'll say x equals datagram long degrees and y equals datagram lat degrees. And this is where the sort of electric or electric parenthesis matching helps because I can see that I have one parenthesis right here and it's matching the beginning of the format, but I also have one over here that I haven't matched. So if I do one more, it's now matching the right on the left. So I need two of those. We'll save that. And again, I'm going to copy the tail part of this that has to get written at the end of the KML. So meta w. And if I paste that right after the for loop, now remember the for loop indenting is right here. So I need to step out because I'm only writing one tail part that finishes up the file. And we're going to loop through. And for each one of those, we're going to add in the point. So let's save that. Hopefully we've 
don't have any typos. We're going to run this and see how it looks before we send it off to Google Earth. If you say run sbet.py sample sbet 2010 tab and 2011 tab, press enter. And now do an ls-l and look in your directory. Cross your fingers and hopefully there should be three KML files. So here's one, here's another one, and there's our sample.sbet.kml. And let's take a look at the 2011 file. So less 2011, press tab, and then put a period KML on the end and see how it looks. It's going to look generally okay. I'm hitting space to go down. Looking great, except for the zeros. So we have those zeros in there. So we need to be able to extract those zeros out of the file because if we draw a line on the earth and some of those points go through zero, that means we're going to go from wherever we are over to Africa and back, which isn't very helpful. Since we're running out of time, I'm going to just show you in the notes briefly what we'll be doing. And we'll try and do it on next Thursday because next Tuesday is going to be Rob Braswell with R doing statistics. R is a free tool for doing some really amazing statistical analysis. It can link up with Python. So we're lucky enough to have Rob be willing to come in and join us. <coughs> we need to be able to compare against zero for a floating point number. So the one thing that Python doesn't come with that seems kind of obvious is floating point comparisons can't be directly equal. You have to have some sort of rounding error willingness in your code. I've written a function called almost equal and it defaults to using this epsilon, which is typically the terminology used for that rounding error that you're willing to tolerate. And Python does have built in to the sys.float underscore info dot epsilon, a default epsilon that's pretty small. What I've done is make a function that takes the default one that, that Python gives you. And if that's not good enough, you can set your own. And we'll take a quick peek at that value. So if we do import sys, sys.float, press tab, and you'll see float underscore info, period, and then tab again. There's a whole lot of junk. But if we type epsilon, press enter, you'll see there epsilon is 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 16. So it's a small, small rounding error in this case, but 0, 0.0 isn't always equal to 0, 0.0, and you don't want to get caught by that. So this function will handle that check, and we'll go ahead and add that into the KML code for next time to throw out those bad points so that when we plot up the SBET, you'll actually see it on the globe. And then we'll jump into creating a database. All right, guys, have a great Thanksgiving. Don't show up to class on Thursday. <laughs>